You are listening to 17 Karat K-Pop. For more information about this show, as well as the other show I do, How to Stan, visit 17karatkpop.weebly.com and subscribe to my newsletter at howtostan.substack.com. K-pop interviews, album reviews, and more. Subscribing is free, but if you want to continue to support my work, feel free to donate. Click the support the show button on the homepage at 17karatkpop.weebly.com. Welcome back to 17 Karat K-Pop. Today we are talking about the history of K-Pop music shows. Both this is a primer for beginners, your intro to these various shows, and hopefully just some interesting history for longtime viewers of those shows. The first thing you need to know is that there are six of these main K-Pop music shows. Airing Tuesday through Sunday, which is why a lot of K-pop releases come out on Mondays and Tuesdays at the start of the week, as opposed to on Fridays, like in the USA. If they drop a song on a Friday, it's usually because they're gearing up for USA promo models. But this K-pop promo model is Tuesday through Sunday. And each night of the week, except for Mondays, there's a K-pop show on TV. A competition show where a bunch of performances live of the latest singles are shown on TV. And then the shows traditionally have a winner. The chart calculation is different for each show. Usually it's a combination of points from a team of professional music critics, judges who work for the network, fan votes, often in real time during the show, music video views, physical album sales, number of digital downloads. It's a lot. And each show tends to have two to four winners of the week. It's changed over time. But out of usually a top 50-ish, the top three-ish are chosen for the final round. And usually, your song that you're promoting cannot be eligible after you win three times. So if you get a triple crown, then the song is removed from contention. Programming starts on Tuesdays with a show that's just called The Show. It's on SBS's MTV. You could also watch via MTV Asia in 18 different countries and on Fortune TV if you're in Myanmar. This show requires you to attend a live broadcast to be eligible. Some shows don't require your presence there, but others do, and this one does. With the one exception in history so far, as of recording time, being Luna this past summer because of quarantine issues. The show calculates their charts based on the number of time songs are played on their MTV, mixed with physical album sales, YouTube views, votes through the StarPass app, sometimes it's been on and off, votes via text as well, gown digital charts. They constantly keep it fresh with who's hosting. It's been so many different artists over time. Block B, Zico, and P.O. are a standout group. Then there's Yeon from CLC and Jeno. They have the longest tenure for show champion hosts ever. In that longest period, from May 2018 to November 2019. That's the longest time there has been a specific group of hosts. On Wednesdays, show champion airs on NBCM, NBC Music, or just NBC. Your song is ineligible after three wins. It's also ineligible if you're just going to fully lip sync. What makes a song ineligible varies a bit by company, but MBS is one of those who has officially decided we've banned total lip syncing. Backing track can be involved, but no lip syncing really. They too have a similar combination of variables that go into their chart calculations, critics' choice, album sales, streaming data. On Show Champion, artists do not have to physically attend or even promote the song for it to be nominated on Show Champion. On Thursdays, Mnet hosts the M Countdown, which you can live stream globally from the M Wave site. A song has to be, in order to be eligible, promoted on at least one music show. It doesn't even have to be affiliated with Mnet. It doesn't have to be M Countdown. But to actually be considered on M Countdown for a music show win, it has to be a song that has been promoted on their music show or a different one. The charts are calculated with a mix of live votes, global fan votes via a bunch of different sites, album sales, YouTube views, and digital sales. M Countdown has diversified their segments probably more than any of these other shows. 
with MCD Drama, MCD News, MCD Ranking, M Studio, Storage M, Dance Challenge. They make it sort of like a variety show more than just a music show. On Fridays, Music Bank airs on KBS2 and via KBS's World Channel in over 100 countries. The songs that KBS bans include songs that overtly reference brand names. So no sly version of product placement via lyrics is allowed. No sense of excessive commercialization in your song or its band. What also makes this network unique is that it lets songs win infinite times. You don't have a cap. No triple crown prevents you from winning again. And most music charts, the total amount of points at the end of the day, if you got a perfect score, could be 10 or 11,000 points. Music Bank uses 200,000 potential points. 200,000. This show is further extra unique, in my opinion, because it gives out this first half of the year award and then a first place award for the most popular song of the entire year. Plus, it features a top two every week, not a top three or four. And it features the top 50 songs of the week. It's pretty cool. It's one of the better ones, if you ask me. On Saturdays, show Music Core, aka just Music Core, airs on NBC. Certain criteria have to be met for your song to be eligible. It has to be have been released no later than two months ago, no OSTs allowed, and no songs from audition shows. You can win up to five times, and then you're ineligible after the quintuple crown. Chart calculations, they've changed it up a lot over time. Sometimes they've used music downloads more, sometimes gown chart data, sometimes more physical album sales, pre-voting and live voting. They've also had giant committees, hundreds if not thousands of people on them, that contribute to an artist's score through this viewer committee voting. So survey participants randomly selected on their email list get to vote. Now that I wish more shows did. Lastly, on Sundays, SBS airs Inky Gayo. They too ban songs that are OSTs from being eligible, as well as audition program songs, and any songs that go against the company's standards of what's suitable for broadcasting. You can win up to three times, the triple crown and then you're out. They seem to have a little less transparency over their chart calculations than the others. But when in doubt, assume that the majority of the percent is based on digital streaming and downloads. Another interesting thing that makes Inkigayo different is they often are a PSA-centered thing. Various social campaigns have had theme songs for them that play during the show, like a commercial for a local event, a safe driving PSA, etc. But these PSAs are kind of in the form of just more music videos during the show. So it does not have the feel of airing a commercial, but it's basically what it is. You may be thinking, oh, so these shows are just like TRL from MTV. Yes and no. So first of all, TRL was on every weekday, and that's obviously not the schedule here. Second of all, TRL focuses on, or at least did, originally live shows and everything being live. The live votes, the live music countdowns, etc. But quite often, Korean music show performances are not live live. They're the kind of live where they say it's live because it has a live audience, I guess, but it's really not live in the sense that when you watch it on TV, those artists at that very moment are indeed performing. It's pretty common to be pre-recorded. Another thing is that Korean music shows do have these interesting, complicated equations for calculating the winner of the week. TRL just kept it pretty simple. Email and phone votes. The most standout difference to me, though, is the difference in feeling gratified for watching. Frankly, a TRL win, by comparison, is not super exciting for a fandom. It's not as directly linked to success in the industry as it is on a K-pop show. If you win TRL and you're a Western artist, it's nice, but you could do without it just fine. If you win a vote on a K-pop show, that opens up further doors for you. It's considered a big career milestone, a moment to stop and reflect and be proud of all your hard work through this intensive boot camp of sorts, pre-debut that you went through for that moment. Some groups get their first win very, very quickly. 
Itzy took less than two weeks post-debut to win a music show, made history by doing so. But then there are acts like Pentagon. It took them four years before they got their first music show in. So it's quite a symbol of a career milestone and success in the cutthroat industry. Plus, it's more rewarding because the artists do get more emotional. I will never get out of my head seeing the emotion on the Monster X members' faces after their big win. It can be quite a started-from-the-bottom emotional moment. Plus, it's more exciting when they win because they often give fans both an encore performance and then a first-place promise. And when they say that, they're talking about doing something goofy as a reward to the fans who voted for them. Maybe it's dressing up in goofy costumes next time they perform the song. Maybe it's picking up a band member and throwing them in the air. Or some other goofy antics on stage in that moment. But they often make a promise in advance what they'll do if they win to incentivize voting. So if you're wondering, how do I go to this show? First of all, if you're not in South Korea, for foreigners it is much easier than any other show to try to get into an M Countdown show. For some of the others, you really need a Korean registered ID to apply online to see if you win the lottery and get access to a show that day. It is free, by the way. But M Countdown, much more accessible, no registration required, you just show up. It's first come, first serve. This access is like 200 people tops, probably, so you gotta get there super, super early, with no guarantee you'll get in. But it is an option, and I do think in the future, more programming will probably take these live shows on the road to more countries. We'll talk about one example in a minute. Now let's walk through a bit of a timeline of how these music shows have changed over time, corresponding to changes in the Western world when it comes to MTV, TRL, music videos, the fan idol relationship, how it played out around the world. Putting these timelines into one timeline leads to some interesting parallels. In the 1980s, there was a significant rise in the amount of appreciation and passion directed towards art and music videos. The 80s is when people realized that video playing could actually come before song playing on the radio and still get a lot of buzz, and actually maybe even more buzz. Building up suspense for the day, the studio version would drop and be something you could tune into on the radio. In 1981, MTV started in the USA. Music television is what it actually stands for, and record sales started spiking right away. The correlation seemed present between MTV viewership and a rise in record sales. Video elements of promoting a song became this whole new world of untapped potential for artists to market themselves, which still has relevance today. Tear all or not, songs are still written sometimes today with that music video concept in mind from the inception. Whether that's good or bad, that they're focusing on how they can market it before just authentically writing about how they feel, that's a moral debate for a different conversation. But the point is, MTV really took advantage of the moment and made that moment more than just a moment but a groundbreaking shift in how the public perceives their fave songs and artists. 1981 is actually also the same year the Korean show Top 10 Songs premiered. It was basically the early version of Music Bank. The Gaio Top 10 premiered in 81, and a decade later, Inky Gaio made its debut under the name SBS Popular Song. That name got changed to TV Gaio 20 in 93, then in 98, it came back and was known once again as SBS Popular Song. It's gone by many names, but Gaio Top 10 ended in 98 to be replaced with Music Bank. And Top 10 Songs, I know, all these terms are confusing, but the point is that whenever one version of the show seemed to be done, a new version or just a rebranded version of the old show would take its place. So there wasn't a time where all these music shows were just canceled. Continuous reboots were made. So then Top 10 Songs was replaced by Bravo New Generation, which had poor ratings and was replaced by Music Bank. Again, the big bottom line is that MTV really started this movement globally to recognize and celebrate singles in a new way. 
MTV did that with live performances, but also promoting music videos. And the focus for these K-pop shows became more so the live performance aspect. So you could say MTV paved the way, but some of these K-pop music shows paved the way for TRL. MTV was out way before TRL. So the timeline goes MTV, K-pop shows, TRL premiere. So maybe they kind of influenced each other. September 14th, 1998. Total Request Live, aka TRL, premiered. Its original form was focused on this after-school hour. Yeah, remember the days you actually had to watch a show at a certain time? So you would rush home from school to watch something? Anyway, that's what TRL was, and it was a video countdown based on fan votes. Or so they say. But the point is the fans did realize, real or not, they were being given some sense of power and agency. Like, hey, I can control what's on my TV. Before that was a thing with Netflix and the like. It gave teens a sense of power they had felt like they lacked. A sense of confidence and self-esteem boost because this network was saying, hey, we're all friends here, no judgment, just unapologetically at full volume, vote for and support your fave, and other people will do the same, and you can convince us to make that song the biggest song in the world. The Backstreet Boys, I want it that way. That was a true sign early on of the power and potential in fandoms. And they really made the push to make sure that song stayed on the TRL chart way more than any other ever had. The show's producers eventually forcibly removed the option from circulation just because the fan demand had just been so prolonged. What Music Bank had been doing is not necessarily just fan votes, but the Music Bank K-pop competition show was also based on this chart system that computed a bunch of different variables together number of downloads on different streaming sites, etc. But the Music Bank predecessor show, the skeleton version of what Music Bank would become essentially, had a chart process that, long story short, had stirred up controversy with its outcome. So they scrapped it and went for a new format in 2001. So at this time, we had Music Bank and SBS Popular Song airing. Remember, SBS Popular Song, the Gaio 20, Take 7, those are all terms for what's today known as Inky Gaio. So right now we had, in the early 2000s, Music Bank and Inky Gaio reigning. I'm just going to keep calling it Inky Gaio, but at the time it was still Take 7 or SBS Popular Song, you know what I mean. So Inky Gaio was, in 2003, deciding to switch things up, and they started giving out this thing called the Moodizen Song. Music and netizen combined. The Mutizen, which sounds like an off-brand Ninja Turtle, but whatever. And the Mutizen Song Award would go to the most popular of the seven artists they decided to feature on the show that week. Inkigayo was really rising, while Music Bank was kind of falling. They decided in 2005 to switch over to recorded shows. They had previously been live, but they switched to recorded shows and also made the mistake of switching to airing on Sunday afternoons. Both of those factors made the show less appealing and exciting to some viewers, and ratings plunged as a result. This period of the 2000s was also working to Inky Gaio's benefit, not just because Music Bank as competition was kind of sinking, but this other show, Live Music Camp, was in tons of hot water. In July 2005, this punk group named Rux, R-U-X, short for Ruckus, basically, caused just that. And during their live performance on Live Music Camp, they streaked. They went full frontal nude on live TV for about four to five whole seconds. Sounds short until you're watching it and or it's your job to censor that stuff. People were so up in arms over this live streaking incident. It is truly, I could probably do a whole other podcast episode about this incident because the impact truly rippled all over the country. The show was fully canceled, not just like some public apology or a brief hiatus for the show. No, flat out canceled because of those four to five seconds. 
took on this political life of its own because at the time, Seoul's mayor had proposed after this incident maybe increasing the scrutiny over what gets aired on TV. So his political opponents then felt like they had an easy win arguing against him and saying, hey, more enforcement, more regulation, more censorship is not the answer. Let's fix the protocols in place we already have. And they did liken him to a dictator. It was a very politically messy aftermath, and it really did distract from the song Rex was performing. So my guess is they did this for the attention to promote their song. Didn't really work out that way. So Inky Gaio seemed kind of primed to stay on top as these other shows were having to deal with dropping ratings or PR disasters. But... Their ascent was not astronomical because the competition went up a notch. A string of other music shows started running. Show Music Core premiered in October 2005, and just a few short months later decided to get rid of their chart system. So the show was solely about watching the live performances on TV. It wasn't about voting or ranking or anything competitive. Music Bank, in 2007, then got another boost because they went back to airing on Friday evenings and they went back to making live shows as opposed to pre-recorded ones. So Inkigayo was like, we need to change up our tactics here to stave off the competition a bit. So they changed their English name from Take 7 to The Music Trend. They changed their time slot a few times and they pivoted to live broadcasts as well. What followed seemed to be years of back and forth, Inky Gaio and Music Bank trying to one-up each other and surpass the continuous rise of other music shows. They just kept staving off the competition, including but not limited to each other. In 2007, Music Core prepared the start of this mobile ranking segment of the show. Then Music Bank was like, we're going to make our show more appealing in 2008 decided to become the longest music program on air at the time with 70-minute episodes. Then they actually increased to 80-minute long episodes in November of that year. Then Inky Gaio got the spotlight again in 2009 when they stopped using digital music charts. They changed up their ranking system significantly, got some headlines from that. Then Music Bank followed suit, changing up their chart calculations in May of that year. And they decided what we're going to do is combine all these categories. Previously, Music Bank had basically had a different week for each category. So one week the win would be based solely on calculating physical album sales that week, for example. And the next week would be the artist would win who won the viewer's choice. And that's it, for example. One variable per week as opposed to an aggregate calculation. So Inkigayo then was like, oh, so you're going to change up your categories too and increase the length of your show? We're going for 70 minutes an episode now too. They also decided maybe they could benefit from changing things up by getting rid of what they considered a stale segment of their show where fans would vote for a super rookie of the month. A new competitor was really in the ranks starting in February 2010. When Mnet, hosting the show M Countdown, announced MCD guys, the M Countdown guys, G-U-Y-Z. This was a group of famous K-pop band members who would MC the show in various combinations of three or four. Members of 2AM, 2PM, CN Blue, and M Black. Remember them? What a time. So this timeline so far can best be summarized as Inkigayo, Music Bank, Inkigayo, Music Bank, Inkigayo, Music Bank, taking the spotlight. Then Mnet came in here with MCD guys and complicated it. With the emphasis on star power, with the performance focus seemingly on the minds of people over at M Countdown and Mnet, Music Bank in 2011 launched a world tour. So they would have live on-the-ground shows in Tokyo, Paris, Hong Kong, Rio de Janeiro, Mexico City, Berlin, Dubai, Santiago. They went all over the place. This was following also about a year earlier when they decided that their show would be available in 54 countries via KBS World. And they started utilizing Twitter more to generate this buzz internationally. So M Countdown starts this MCD guys thing. Then Music Bank launches a world tour, 
expands their audience globally and focuses on cultivating that global fan base with the help of social media. And then they decided to run for 105 minutes an episode, right after the KBS Nightly News, no less. Then in 2012, in July, Gundam Style by Psy came out and changed the world. Really made K-pop breakthrough globally in ways it had not before, on everyone's mind more than ever. And that's also when KCON started, the big K-pop convention hosted by, who else, Mnet. So first you had Mnet with their MCD guys. Music Bank then went to a live tour format. The next year, Mnet started KCON. During this Gundam style fervor, Inkigayo and SBS as a channel decided to take a cue from Mnet and Music Bank. Gundam Style came out July 15th, 2012, the exact same day that SBS decided Inkigayo would resume its Mutizen Son Award, and it was right around the time SBS issued a statement saying, quote, We believe that rather than the ranking system, the most important thing is the genre K-pop being recognized worldwide. Therefore, we have decided to abolish the system after much discussion. There's really no meaning behind a ranking system. We have decided to undergo this change in hopes that viewers can just enjoy the music. There are a lot of K-pop stars in the music industry that have talent. We wanted to break free from the repetitive system, so we plan on redesigning our system by having the concept of more special stages. For viewers to enjoy the music, we will have more collaboration stages and much more. So they too decided they're on to something. Let's lean hard into this Hallyu wave sweeping the world. The following month in August 2012, the cable channel Mix TV started airing the first ever English dub version of Music Bank. In 2013, Inkigayo seemingly just sort of abandoned their initial statement about charts are meaningless, what's the point anyway, and resumed a chart system, teaming up with the gown charts to do so, so maybe it was this big financial incentive they had. In the first half of 2013, a lot of music shows were still undergoing a bunch of tweaks. Show Champion was now a competitor among these shows, decided to change to a live format as well. The network that hosts Inkigayo started a new segment involving a fan Q&A. If you submit questions via their app, they premiered this Inkigayo showcase segment to highlight indie and underdog talent. They started a new charting system. Music Core decided to go from four finalists each week to just three. In 2013, and again in 2014, Girls' Generation became the only group to get a perfect score on M Countdown of all 11,000 points. In late 2014, the show, literally the name of this music show, the show, also newly started using this charting system. So basically at this point, these music shows were competing over who could deliver the best contributions to the global recognition to that Hallyu wave, who could surf the Hallyu wave the best, basically, and who could one-up each other in terms of chart calculation systems and live performances. The next way they sort of tried to indirectly one-up each other and change things up was by changing who could be the winner of the week and how many times the song could win. In 2015, Show Champion joined others in using a triple crown system, meaning if you win three times, your song is no longer eligible for that top prize. Not related, but I just think it's interesting because it's super notable and special, the memory. In May 2015, at this point in the timeline, BTS gets their first music show win for I Need You on the show. In November 2015, NBC decided to get rid of their chart system, saying, quote, instead of the ranking system, we intend to show more diverse genres of music and continue to work hard to be a representative program of Korea. They issued that statement with this plan to, instead of pitting artists against each other, focusing more on diversifying the music from Korea they were showing off to the world now which seems like an important tonal shift at NBC, 
that was missing from conversations in 2020 when Seventeen and G-Friend, fans speculated both of those acts, had been banned from performing on Music Core, and no one bought the statement Music Core issued, saying, no, we're not banning them from performing here. We need to diversify our lineup so it's not in all this one mainstream pop category, I guess you could say. We could have a separate debate about G-Friend and Seventeen's music being so unique it still deserved to help diversify the lineup as they put it, but I digress. Music Core, years before fans thought you suddenly banned Hybe-affiliated artists from going on your show, they had already planned to try to make their show stand out in terms of what musical acts they invited on. And all the other shows were inviting on G-Friend and Seventeen. So their excuse is not as BS as people thought it was. Still the wrong decision in my opinion, but it's important context. In early 2016, they tested out this ultra-high-def version of filming the show that didn't last. But what I admire about all these music shows, frankly, is their constant desire to keep tweaking and trial-running ideas. That's how companies thrive long-term. 2017 had some huge, interesting changes that weren't overtly linked to each other, but I could see some of these events being related. That is when Music Bank came back from a two-year hiatus for their world tour. They hadn't had a world tour in two years, but they came back out in 2017. This is also when Key left his hosting gig for M Countdown, and that led to a stream of guest hosts having to fill in. And this is the year the TRL reboot launched. At this time, MTV was really trying to ensure continued relevancy for Gen Z, basically, the next generation. They hired a bunch of social media correspondents and focused more than ever on cultivating the social media personality for the brand. And they started a rebooted version of TRL, which I used to watch, frankly, and didn't care for because they basically played relay games instead of taking time for a music video countdown. Not sure if it's even, if it even deserves to call itself TRL anymore if you get rid of the music video countdown element. It did have live performances, but it just was not the same. Did not have the same spark as the original. So M Countdown was forced to change things up, MTV was trying to change things up, and then Music Core took that year also as a time to bring back their chart system. Just two years prior, they had issued the statement about the importance of diversifying the lineup, and then they kind of walked it back a bit and didn't say they were no longer in pursuit of that goal, but they just decided also charts mattered to them too. And maybe they were unnecessarily, it turns out, but still warily watching the TRL reboot and wondering, hmm, is this going to steal some of our now global thunder? We thought we had replaced you, and now you rose from the dead. (laughs) M Countdown, then, really dug into a global approach from April 2018 to March 2019. They had this global crew of MCs hosting the show from various places and languages. In March 2019, ITZY became the fastest girl group to win a triple crown on a music show. And they also took less than 10 days to win their first award after debut. Really just getting showered in accolades right off the bat. Which sparked some online discourse about big three companies, as they're called, getting an advantage possibly in these award shows. These artists often get the chance to perform on these shows. They get moved to the front of the list if they are from a big company. My take on that is, that I wish the discussion was totally severed and separated between what is right in terms of what the artists themselves deserve, what ITZY deserves, and what the companies deserve. Because this is an issue where people argue that the underdog acts are in a self-fulfilling prophecy cycle of being underdog acts because they don't get mass exposure because they're at the bottom of the waiting list for appearing on these award shows. So then their song doesn't get nominated for Best of the Week, no one votes on it, people aren't talking about it online, and it doesn't win. And then you have these big groups from big companies who go on the shows and get tons of promo, tons of votes, the Triple Crown in record time. 
So you can point out the disparity there without shaming or blaming Itzy. Anyway, the latest notable developments in the world of music shows, in February of this year, Music Core also started using a quintuple crown prize. Five wins and you're done. And July of this year, the latest report on the state of the fan industry, as it's dubbed, the fan economy, the fan industry, the fan-driven world, it's a paper issued by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Korea Foundation, which I will link to as always on my site. The latest report from them says, the number of global K-pop fans officially surpassed 100 million people in 2020. And how you spending last year rose to 8 trillion won. My general prediction is that A, all these K-pop music shows are going to continue to have their up and down moments. They're going to keep tweaking their charts or deciding to get rid of them or have them again. They're going to keep trial running stuff, switching up hosts regularly, trying to keep things fresh and stand out from the others. B, the live performance aspect of what they do will continue to be paramount, especially post-pandemic when all the shows get to have the return of live audiences. I definitely think they're going to try to one-up each other, artist-wise and company-wise, to make those live shows so spectacular. Like, all their creativity the past two years bottled up will just burst out. Next level performances, constant alterations, and C, I don't think TRL will ever thrive again. I really don't. I don't see a reboot. Unless it gets a really dynamic, beloved host, it's not happening. I feel like at this point, it has been branded very millennial when it's not necessarily, but I just feel like it'll take a lot to convince Gen Z people. I know I'm kind of including myself there, you know, I'm kind of on the cusp. But anyway, younger people maybe just feel like that branding is old. I don't know, I just don't know if they, younger people, I guess we're just not that into, or don't see the appeal as much in TRL because it's not unique. We've grown up with social media, with the constant sense of entitlement to engage in a participatory, music show, vote-related culture. We've grown up with this active participation in supporting and perpetuating our favorite idols' careers and successes. We're used to helping them win awards. So the novelty of a show like TRL has worn off. And with the rise of access to K-pop shows globally, we've got tons of other shows to watch. So adding TRL to the queue, not a high priority. But I do think the mass appeal of these shows and music videos period and the whole performative visual aspect of musicianship will always be a key thing. It will never just resort to audio-only entertainment, no visuals. As I talked about in the episode called The Art of the K-Pop Music Video, music is just brought to life in such a next-level way that affects our brains psychologically, are kind of like our minds in a dreamlike state. It adds this constant memory recall, mixed with the sense of not operating by the constraints of logic, there are a lot of parallels we've talked about when it comes to music videos and literally dreaming when you're asleep. The cool real-time action, it could provoke physical responses, a shift in your psychological state, abrupt scene transitions. They help us find a visual to put our energy into and see our own hard-to-describe feelings reflected back to us in a tangible way. Very therapeutic. That wraps up my summary of music chart history. More on Korean entertainment in its many genres is coming on future episodes of the show, so stay tuned for that. In the meantime, thank you all for listening to another episode of 17 Karat K-Pop, and I will talk to you all again very soon.